Good morning from Washington. I'm Shihoko Goto, Deputy Director for Geoeconomics with the Wilson Center's Asia Program. For those of you who are logging into a Wilson Center event for the very first time, wherever you might, might be today, a very warm welcome to you. The Wilson Center was established in 1968 as an act of Congress to be an institution that brings together the worlds of ideas and actions in the realm of foreign policy. The Asia program focuses on deepening understanding of Asia and the United States and furthering the policy debate on issues of US interests in the region. Of course, if there is one word to describe the political scene in Washington today, it is division. A deep schism prevails on Capitol Hill and beyond on a range of foreign as well as domestic policy issues. But China has seemed to be one key issue upon which there is consensus with bipartisan support for costing Beijing as a strategic competitor and even a threat to US interests. In fact, the consensus about Chinese competitions has had much impact as disruptions caused during the pandemic in pushing the Biden administration to identify and invest in key industries. Wariness about Chinese aggressions in the political, economic and security spheres have also driven Washington to reach out to treaty allies and like-minded nations in the Indo-Pacific to work together to push back against the China threat. And indeed, from voicing collective support for Taiwan through official public statements, uh, to furthering security ties with the United States, to taking a stance against unfair trade practices of non-market economies, there seemingly is greater alignment and greater daring in pushing back against Beijing. There is, though, of course, a divide within Washington about just how, if not whether, to strengthen the United States economically as well as militarily in competing against China. But for countries across Asia, which are not only geographically much closer to and often bordering China, with all having greater economic ties with China than they do with the United States, the challenge is more about defining and ensuring their own interests amid great power competition between both Beijing and Washington. Today's discussion is about the conundrum China poses from the perspective of governments across the Indo-Pacific and beyond. Uh, we will also address the region's evolving relations with the United States. It is an ambitious agenda for the next 90 minutes, and I'm excited to be able to introduce some of the sharpest minds in the region. To start us off will be Xin Xin Pan, who was until very recently the Wilson Center's Taiwan scholar for the summer. Uh, she's just returned to Taipei and she is an assistant professor at Suzhou University. Following her will be Wen Xin Wu, Associate Research Fellow of Political Science at Academia Seneca. Following uh, Wen Xin will be Tung Hong Lin, also at Academia Seneca as a Research Fellow of Sociology. Uh, following uh, Tung Hong will be Koji Kagosani. Associate Professor of Economics at the Osaka University of Economics. Jiayin Chong, Associate Professor of Political Science, National University of Singapore will follow. Then Andrew Oros, um, a Wilson Center Fellow and Professor of Political Science at Washington College. And last but certainly not least will be Brian Carlson, Head of Global Security of the Think Tank Center for Security Studies at ETH Zurich. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Shin Shin, but before I do, I would re be remiss if I did not say that we invite uh, those who are watching live to send in your questions, either via email or Twitter. You can email us at asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet us at Asia Program. Again, the email address is asia at wilsoncenter.org and the Twitter, uh, is at Asia program. So with that, Shin Shin. Well, thank you, Shihoko. Thank you for introduction. My name is Shin Shin Pan, and um, I am a Taiwan uh, fellow um, at the Wilson Center, as well as assistant professor of sociology at Suzhou University based in Taiwan. Um, today, I'm going to talk about confronting the China conundrum from the perspective of public opinion in Taiwan 
Uh, these days, we have intensive discussions about how Taiwan becomes the most dangerous place on Earth. Given its geographical significance, um, Taiwan is one of the most likely places where the United States and China would, would engage in war. And such a uh, conflict would have, would have a great potential to drag the whole world into the World War III. And so the significance of, of discussing about the uh, situation of Taiwan admit in the US-China confrontations is evident. And previously, uh, throughout the US history, um, we see that the U US presidents um, like to use, would like to uh, uh, intensively engage in negotiations and agreements to settle all the tensions, the confrontations. That is one of the possible routes uh, um, in settling, settling the possible tensions uh, between China and Taiwan, where is the key issue in the US-China confrontations. Taiwanese are not strangers to negotiations and agreements, uh, making of agreements with China, where the cross-strait talks took place in 1993, 2008, and 2015. So, though, so if, though, if the United States should decide to meddle in and then negotiations and should be a one of a routes to settle the tensions between China and Taiwan. So what would people in Taiwan say about such negotiations? What would they imagine the negotiate agreements? What kind of agreement they could possibly accept? The answer is sovereignty and security on the table, not economy. So I, my co-author and I conduct the uh, experimental survey in Taiwan in, the uh, in this year, early in the spring, in 2021. So we first come up with the takes. Uh, we come up with the, uh, we, we, when we look at back in history, China has, makes, uh, has made several offers to Taiwan for those policy highlighted in gold. Those are economic incentives. So those are uh, highlighted marked in orange uh, that, that those are policies uh, related to sovereignty, Taiwan sovereignty. And for those uh, marked in red, those are security related issues. Those are policies that China could uh, offer to Taiwan to win their support for uh, if those policies should show up as uh, Taiwan's takes from China in the agreement. So for all agreements, where there is a takes, there must be gifts. Taiwan's offer to China, we also come up with four policies that Taiwan's, uh, Taiwan offers to China. And I use apply the same, I color those policies in the same logic. So those economic, sovereign and security related issues are Taiwan's policies offered to China. So in our experiment survey, uh, respondents are presented with a screenshot like this. So we randomize the combination as well as the number of policies in terms of gives and takes in agreement to test how um, respondents in Taiwan would support uh, supporting rate for those uh, green simulated agreements. And here's the result. What do people in Taiwan want from China? Top three policies that are can most likely boost the supporting rate in Taiwan. First, give up the use of force against Taiwan. Second, reduce the missiles and drills targeting at Taiwan. Third, support Taiwan's entry to WHO. As we can see, those three top wants, takes Taiwan, Taiwan wants from China are sovereignty, uh, security and sovereignty related. And what do people in Taiwan would like to give to China? Unfortunately, we're put, we're, Taiwanese are a bit um, unwilling to give like nothing to China, but for those gifts and policies given to China, there are, there are two policies that uh, people in Taiwan would mostly um, uh, oppose against the giving them to China. First, recognize one China policy, one China policy, Second, keep the option of unification with China. In other words, any politicians who dares to put any of the two policies on the table to China, they will have to pay a dear cost. That and those policies, 
those um, two policies would greatly reduce the supporting rate in any agreement to be accepted by the people in Taiwan. So we further simulate the policies to come up the worst case scenario and the best case, case scenario agreements in Taiwan. Uh, for the worst case scenario, that is for Taiwan to give everything, uh, make all the policy concessions to Taiwan, but, but to China, but receives nothing from China. In the worst case scenario agreement, that still wins 70% of supporting rate in Taiwan. Um, on the other hand, for the best case scenario um, agreement in Taiwan, um, that's the kind of agreement that where China gives everything to Taiwan and Taiwan makes zero policy concessions. And even in, uh, and for anyone who, who are familiar with the Chinese policies, for those, it is extremely difficult for the Chinese government to make all the policy concessions to Taiwan at once in an agreement. Actually, any of the policy concessions will be extremely difficult in Chinese politics. And even so, such agreement wins only 54.6% of Taiwanese support. That is, uh, a, that is only a little bit more than half, half of the population um, in, in Taiwan. That is the very little support for cross-strait negotiations in Taiwan. And why is that? 90% of Taiwanese say China is not credible. That has everything to do with China's breach of the Sino-UK joint declarations is, as a historical document and China's oppression on Hong Kong that makes Taiwan people, Taiwanese believe that China is not credible. So for any US president, who wishes to make negotiations as a route to settle the tensions between China and Taiwan that will make any politicians in Taiwan pay a dear cost. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Chen for that very perceptive um, analysis. And I know we'll be going back to the whole idea of management of cross-strait tensions um, later on today, but first let me turn next to uh, Wen Chen Wu. Okay, great. Uh, can you see my can you see my uh, screen? Okay, great. Okay, thank you for the invitation. It's a great honor to be uh, able to present my uh, recent research here. And it's also great to follow Xinxin's uh, comment on China's credibility. And actually, according to the agenda, I'm assigned to uh, discuss or to present something regarding China's regional ambitions and interests in Taiwan. But I think this is a very huge topic and I might not be able to discuss it in uh, seven to 10 minutes. So I decide to uh, twist it a little bit by uh, connecting the topic to one of my uh, recent research regarding uh, our uh, experimental survey in several countries in East Asia. And we try to, uh, we will try to show you that, okay, there are some difficult situation facing China to get uh, credibility or trust among East Asian countries. And that will be also the case for their uh, so-called uh, vaccine diplomacy in China. So I'm Wen Qing Wu, uh, Associate Research Fellow of Institute of Political Science at Virginia Sinica. So uh, yeah, we know now China face many domestic and international challenges. And those challenges may destabilize or at least delegitimize the CCP's authoritarian rule in China. So there are many, many serious questions or problems facing China. So domestically, we know that they have a very serious inequality issue and the confrontation between uh, the rich and the poor become more and more fierce so that uh, the, the president of China recently tried to implement some program that will, uh, get the rich to share some of their wealth with the, the poor. So inequality is actually, according to literature in comparative politics, is very important to the survival of the autocratic regime. 
However, when China is getting more and more uh, unequal in terms of its, its rich, uh, distribution of wealth, uh, we also observe that there is a process of autocratization in China because we know we, we see that after Xi's second turn, uh, he tries to concentrate power in his hand. So there's, uh, and we also uh, show that uh, the CCP regime get tough and tough uh, on many, many issues, especially the issue on Hong Kong. So there is a research agenda called autocratization, uh, especially the autocratization of China. So there is also then, it, then there will be a, a more serious issue regarding the post Xi era because now we know that uh, uh, she become the dictator or uh, the most powerful man in China, then although uh, the, the term limit has been lifted, but they, someday he, he, he still need to step down. Then I think the entire Chinese communist regime uh, facing, uh, is uh, facing a very serious problem of uh, post uh, post C power struggle. Although it's not obvious now, but I think many political elites are thinking about this issue uh, privately. Okay, so that's a domestic issue uh, facing China. And we also know that uh, according to our uh, recent development in East Asia or international uh, uh, organizations, uh, China is facing a, a serious uh, problem of credibility or reputation deficit which means that uh, many, many countries uh, worry about uh, non peacefulizing China. Then that will make many countries, especially those democratic countries, more cautious about China's foreign policy or how they should deal with China. And as I mentioned a little bit uh, earlier, then China become more autocrat and people may have concerns regarding autocrat regimes. Then it raised more concerns about China's relation with other countries, especially those in East Asia countries. So I think uh, uh, Zhong Hong and Koji will talk more about uh, these issues regarding the situation in Hong Kong and Japan. But in general, we know that uh, the neighboring countries in East of the neighboring countries of China in East Asia were uh, are very worried about China's rights. So then the question becomes. It's China need to gain trust in the international society, especially among its East Asian neighbors. Otherwise, it might uh, face some difficulty of uh, promote of promoting its policy or try to get along well with those countries. And so that's a background. Unfortunately, uh, we observe that recently, especially in the past two years there is an aggressive style of uh, diplomacy called uh, wolf warrior diplomacy. So we observe that, uh, we observe that many Chinese diplomats uh, try to uh, use a very uh, aggressive tone or aggressive style of language uh, to uh, criticize or to fight against some criticisms on China. So there is a, a rise of a wolf warrior diplomacy. Actually, uh, that's a, that's a, a turn a that from a movie uh, made in China, which is also called Wolf Warrior. And then now they try to uh, say that those uh, aggressive diplomats are Wolf Warrior. However, we also see that, okay, as a rebuttal, uh, Hua Chunying, uh, who is a Chinese foreign ministry spokeswoman, uh, mentioned that, okay, uh, he, he tried to uh, make clear that uh, China is not implement World Warrior diplomacy. Instead, uh, she used uh, the metaphor of the Lion King, which is also a Hollywood movie. So because there's a, a small, cute uh, little lion called Simba, and then, yeah, we, we, we saw that movie. So I, I don't think I need to explain the movie further. So anyway, he tried to explain that, okay, because uh, China is like Simba, which is a cute little lovely lion, but uh, that little lion uh, suffered from many, many challenges and attacks. But eventually the lion has grown up with, yeah, and become the Lion King. So that's the metaphor uh, uh, Hua Sunying tried to uh, use 
to say that, okay, uh, China actually is a lovely little lion. So it's, uh, we are not a war warriors. And a few months later, uh, pre the, uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China also mentioned that, okay, we must pay attention to grasp the tongue, both open and confident, but also modest and humble to strive and create a credible, lovable and respectable image of China. Then that, that made me think of the, the uh, Kung Fu Panda because uh, in a, before the Wolf Warrior, uh, people may have some impression on China regarding Panda, which is uh, lovable and probably respectable. But after the Wolf Warrior diplomacy, then yeah, people become more suspicious about China's uh, uh, diplomacy. And yeah, so we need to emphasize that, okay, China tried to have a, a we call it credible, lovable and respectable image. However, according to recent poll, uh, according to a, yeah, a public opinion poll conducted by Pew uh, last year, uh, many countries, especially those democratic countries uh, become less trusted in China. So we can see that there is a declining trust, which is the blue line on the figure uh, in China. So the distrust on China uh, increases, especially in 2020 after the COVID-19 outbreak uh, begin. And we also see that, okay, in China's neighboring countries like Japan or South Korea, the, this, the level of distrust uh, becomes a high historical high historically high. So that also uh, signal that, okay, many countries uh, are worrying about the Lion King, okay? <laughs> and, but how, how, how do China overcome this kind of what's called uh, credit, credibility deficit? Especially uh, when people believe that the COVID-19 spread from China to the world. Then China tried to use it, uh, a strategy called uh, vaccine diplomacy. So uh, although China uh, suffered from the COVID at the beginning of uh, 2020, but it uh, quickly developed some vaccines and China tried to donate or to uh, export its COVID vaccine to many countries in the world. And according to this figure uh, taken from the economist, we saw that, okay, both China and Russia gave a lot of uh, COVID machines to developing countries, especially those in uh, Africa and Latin American countries. And this is also another figure uh, calculated by BBC. So uh, we, we know that uh, Sinopharm and also uh, there's uh, another one, I, Sinovac. So those two vaccines are developed by China. So uh, it also, uh, is China also explored those two kind of vaccine to the world. Uh, so, why do we focus on the vaccine diplomacy? Because we, we think that, okay, when China tried to overcome the credit deficit, as Xinxin has mentioned in Taiwan, many people uh, do not trust in China. And I think that kind of situation also exists in many, many other countries as we have seen from the Pew's uh, public opinion poll result. And when China try to give vaccines to those countries, then probably they try to uh, save some old friend and they try to make new friend. So they try to gain uh, the trust or a good reputation among their friend. So we wonder whether that will be successful or not. So to investigate this issue, we conduct uh, surveys in uh, seven countries in East Asia over seven, uh, yeah, including Hong Kong, Japan, Philippines, Singapore, South Korea, and also Taiwan. So the survey was conducted by uh, May, 2021. So probably three to four uh, months ago. And we try to uh, provide different set of vaccines to our uh, respondent and see whether they will choose vaccine developed or produced by China or other countries. And this is a result uh, according to our survey uh, experiment. 
And I know this figure looks pretty tiny and maybe unable to observe. So I try to yeah, run in a little bit. And we can see that when the vaccine, so this is a statistical result, but I can explain it further. So this is a coefficient. So when there is a positive coefficient, and which means that the, that kind of vaccine will be uh, more preferred to the baseline vaccine, which is China. So in the first two categories, uh, indicate that China is a developer of the vaccine or the producer of the vaccine. And we use China as the baseline. And we can see that in Hong Kong, Japan, or the Philippines, all vaccines developed by Germany or their own country or Russia or even the United States are almost more preferred by vaccine developed by China. So which means that China, Chinese vaccines are least preferred by uh, respondents in those countries. So this is the first three countries we survey, and this is the other uh, three countries, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. So we see that, okay, uh, the Chinese vaccine, whether it's produced by China or developed by China, are less preferred uh, to the vaccine, uh, less preferred by respondent in those countries. So that's a, also a signal of serious credibility deficit because when people can choose, they won't choose Chinese vaccines. And we know that, okay, why? So we explore it a little bit. We saw that, okay, that might be a result of countries distrust in China. So we try to, uh, it, ask our respondent whether they trust China or uh, they don't trust China. So this is a proportion of trust. And we can see that in Japan, uh, Korea, and Taiwan. So very few people <laughs> trust China or think China is trustworthy. Instead, they think that, OK, they have higher trust in the US. That's why in those figures, we can see that the US vaccines are more popular than Chinese vaccines. So in this case, so we divided a uh, respondent into two groups, uh, one group with low trust in China and the other group is high trust in China. So we can see that when people have high trust in China, they tend to uh, be more supportive or be more favorable to Chinese vaccines. But when they have very low trust in China, it's very unlikely for them to choose Chinese vaccines. And the difference is about 21%. Which means that if a respondent is uh, become more trust in China, so it's, it's tr his trust uh, increase from low to high, then the probability for this respondent to choose Chinese medicine will be increased by 21%. So that's a very huge uh, increase in terms of the choice probability. So the next question becomes, okay, if, if many people don't trust in China, then how could, uh, China increase its credibility or how can its international trust, then we conduct another survey. So we ask our respondent some questions regarding the WHO approval of the Chinese vaccines. So why do we try to use this kind of research design is that the reason we use that kind of design is that we try to uh, show that the international organizations may increase uh, Chinese credibility. So we ask our respondents for four kinds of questions first, and then we conduct a survey in Taiwan. And the reason we choose Taiwan is that, as mentioned, uh, as, as, as mentioned by Xinxin, is that Taiwanese people don't trust uh, China. So if we can find that, okay, even in the place or a country where people don't trust China, then if the WHO approval becomes uh, effective, then probably international organizations can help China to increase their credibility. So we conduct another experimental survey and then we ask our respondents the following four questions. The first question is uh, whether our respondents support uh, Taiwanese government to purchase vaccine from foreign countries. So in this question, we don't specify which countries uh, we should import the vaccines. And the second question is uh, whether they support uh, our government to uh, purchase or to import vaccines developed by China. So you can see the difference. One is that uh, foreign countries in general, and the other is specifically pointing to China. And that's the first two questions. 
And also because uh, China now have uh, two vaccines that is approved by uh, the WHO and incorporate into the COVAX uh, uh, platform. So similarly, we ask our respondents whether they support our government to purchase vaccines developed by foreign countries and approved by the WHO. And the last question is whether uh, our respondents support uh, Taiwanese government to purchase uh, Chinese vaccines and approve it by the WHO. So by comparing those four, uh, the, the, the support rate of those four questions, we can see or we can calculate the effect of WHO approval on Chinese vaccines, in addition to the WHO approval on the uh, foreign vaccines. And here's, here is the result. And we got some very interesting results. And you can see for the first two groups, Taiwanese respondents uh, do not support their government to uh, purchase Chinese vaccines. So you can see the gap between the first two bars. So in general, uh, respondents are very supportive. 95% of them supported the government purchase of foreign vaccines. But when the identity becomes, when the identity becomes uh, Chinese vaccine, it will be uh, dropping to 38. Yeah. And, but also if we get the WHO, if the vaccine get WHO approval, then it will increase from 38 to 47. So we think this is a very interesting and important result. What, what, what does it mean? So my next slide is that, uh, we know that the, the, the right in China with an aggressive uh, style of diplomacy may uh, worry the world. So it may increase the distrust on China in many, many countries. However, ch to, for China to gain trust or credibility in the international society, one thing that China can do is that to get the approval or to get along well with the international organizations, which means that China may need to adapt or adapt into or integrate into the existing international order instead of challenging it. So I think that will be the most important takeaway of my presentation, which means that to gain uh, international reputation or trust, China need to uh, integrate into the existing international order. Yeah, so that will be my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wenxin, for that very rich um, analysis of China's vaccine diplomacy conundrum. And I know that uh, we can expand this to talk about you know, COVAX and the, the success and uh, challenges facing COVAX and what role China can play in that as well. But uh, before I, we do that, I'd like to now turn to Tom Hong. Yes, and uh, um, uh, I will talk about the situation as I know about Hong Kong because I have lived in Hong Kong. Uh, before I come to Taiwan to uh, uh, get my job in, um, in uh, Academia Sinica, I, I study, in, I get my PhD in Hong Kong, uh, um, and I also uh, participated in some uh, civil society, some social movements there. So uh, I, uh, I find that, it, although I'm, I'm not now in Hong Kong, but I think that um, it may be much better for presenting Hong Kong, something about Hong Kong, by someone not now in Hong Kong. <laughs> this is largely because the, after the national security law, in fact, this is a big problem for Hong Kongers who, part, who try to participate in such kinds of conference or some workshop that talk about uh, diplomacy, uh, uh, about uh, uh, United States. So uh, I, I think that, uh, and I now I will also share a true story that just happened during the last three days. Uh, three days ago, I see my friend, one of my friend, uh, his name being put on the Wen Hui Bao. Wen Hui Bao is a newspaper that uh, controlled by Beijing, but uh, 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 um, press in, in Hong Kong. And uh, Wen Hui Bao says that this professor who worked for Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, now I don't want to say his name, uh, but you can check out uh, Bao. Then uh, I see the name on the Wenhui Bao say this professor worked for Chinese University of Hong Kong. He is a suspected work for um, 
uh, trade union in Hong Kong and also collude with United States uh, agencies. In fact, he, the, the, in, in, the, in, in the newspaper, in the news that they say that they get some funding from AFL-CIO. The, the trade union in, in, in the United States that, but you know that uh, in, the, in the free country, trade unions, you usually have that kinds of connections with each other. You put some funding into a research, a, 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 a research program that you study trade union in Hong Kong or in China. So that uh, uh, make some projects uh, usually used to really uh, sometimes only some for some repos of research for some human rights organize, uh, NGO. Uh, 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 or, or for the AFL-CIO itself. But uh, he's accused that he colluded with some, uh, you, you, uh, 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 the, the, with the United States agencies. And then in that day, three days ago, I take a message to, to a friend that very close to him, say, would you come to Taiwan? Uh, immediately, if you think that is a good place to at least to uh, escape from the from that uh, 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 that kinds of uh, um, troubles for a while, then uh, then uh, the friends uh, uh, reply to me say, uh, yes, uh, he uh, he is considering that, but I mean no, he said don't know, he is still considering, and then today uh, yesterday I get another message from from her, that is a friend between a professor and me, say that he is now flying to London. And uh, he's not landing uh, uh, yet. But I, I take the message back to you, say that he is now, I think that he is safe. So this is a true story that happened during the last three days. And uh, um, this is also a true situation, I think that really happened in Hong Kong. We are observing a torture, a long torture uh, of the whole uh, democratic movement uh, activists there. And uh, so uh, I want to, first of all, update some uh, situation crackdown in Hong Kong right now. And uh, we see that in fact, the crackdown have two waves. The first wave happened in the uh, early 2020s after the pandemic. and. Uh, uh, focus on basically before 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 the pandemic we have uh, we have observed a crackdown targeted at the activ activists of umbrella movement happened during 2014, and then we have uh, uh, another wave of crackdown in early 2020 that end at the, uh, some radical and uh, somehow there are some 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 uh, dog fights on the streets. So we have uh, some 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 radical and more violent young protests have been arrested by by the police officers and also been accused. But at that uh, at before to, uh, July 2020, uh, the 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 national security law is not well prepared until July. So uh, before that, we see the the punishment itself is somehow much more moderate. But from July after July 2020, we see that the second wave of the crackdown is almost a no mercy. So it there was um, uh, uh, based on the national security law now in Hong Kong. Indeed, if someone participated in this kinds of uh, conference, he, may, he or she may be accused. So, um, uh, the the crackdown in crowd uh, destroyed the free media. In crowd uh, dismissed the Democratic opposition parties by so-called DQ. DQ means disqualified, so they were they can dismiss the the, the position, uh, kick out the the, the Congress uh, party party parliament parliament uh, 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 So. Uh, they, it also in crowd uh, diminish the major organizations of civil society. Uh, what I mentioned about the, 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 the professor that in fact he worked for the trade union as a participant, uh, act, uh, as an activist. So the trade unions now become the targets. If someone has some connection with AFL-CIO, he or she will also be targeted. 
and uh, being punished. So um, uh, then now we also see that the next step will be arrest and uh, expel of some famous liberal scholars or some left wing spark scholars participating in the uh, trade unions, organizations or movements. So um, now as we know that there are more than uh, 10,000 uh, people being accused and uh, around 2,500 2, being arrested. And why the ones, why the 10,000 people is not all arrested is only because the capacity of the jail is limited. So uh, they only arrested 2,000 something. So uh, in 2020 and 2021, as we know that there are more than uh, 100,000 people left Hong Kong. Like what I mentioned, the professor left, left three days ago. So uh, 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 they migrate to the other countries. Some, in fact, Taiwan is the third, I guess. I think that I see a rank. It's the third uh, greatest uh, uh, place to, to for the Hong Kong migrants. Uh, uh, the first one is, uh, uh, of course, United, uh, United Kingdom, and the second is Canada, and the third is uh, basically uh, around United States or Taiwan. So um, um, then the, I will talk about the expectation in the next five years. Uh, I think that the crackdown will be continued. And uh, this is largely because Xi, Xi Jinping will continue his third term of CCP and also PRC top leaders in 2022. And uh, uh, the priority will be keeping his power and also uh, 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 put, uh, put basically crack down the, all the uh, oppositions uh, in, in Hong Kong. And uh, Hong Kong protest was the major political resistance in his first term and second term uh, from the umbrella movement to the um, uh, the, the protest in uh, 2019. So from the hardliners view, Beijing will, was too moderate to stop the protest before 2020. So uh, the next step will be no mercy. And uh, the strategy will be killing the kitchens to warn the, the monkey that is uh, punish one city, the Hong, uh, Hong Kong protesters, and then to uh, 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 afraid to make uh, make fair to the to the others who want who dare to do something like that in China. So um, uh, I and also if we observe the uh, the punishment so far, we will see that the imprisonment that been charged are all more than six years for the uh, political uh, prisoners which means that the, they will be put into jail until 2027. So it also means that Xi Jinping may consider the next term that should happen in 2027. During this period, Hong Kong should be kept quiet. So uh, I think that the, we will continuously observe the crackdown to the education system, to the internet also, uh, I think that China will set up sort of uh, uh, internet censorship, very similar to China in Hong Kong. And also uh, introduce more and more Chinese migrants to replace the Hong Kong elites. So uh, uh, also encourage sort of uh, public tip offs that try to uh, make people quiet. So uh, what should be done? I think that uh, there, were, there may be some suggestion in the next five years or even one decade that uh, there are still a lot of uh, tools, some, uh, some strategies to deal with that. Uh, think about some very extreme uh, uh, scenario, such as uh, maybe two dozens <coughs> of young activists being released from the jail, some Hong Kong Hong Kong activists they come to the they go to the uh, PR, uh, the the, the uh, people's uh, 
uh, liberal army's uh, uh, office in the cent central of the Hong Kong Island and uh, attack that, that office, then what will happen? The, if the young activists attack uh, PLA uh, office in Hong Kong, it will become, it will, of course, someone will die. Mm -hmm. And also they were accused, uh, the, 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 the uh, Beijing may accuse that the United States uh, 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 do something to that. So uh, if you face that kind of a very uh, extreme scenario, then you still have to consider some very strong uh, economic sanctions or political sanctions. So uh, I think that they are still possible to use, for example, stop to exchange Hong Kong dollars and uh, United States, uh, US dollars, the link, the link, the so-called linkage exchange rate. So um, also it pass, it's still possible to uh, try to regulate Hong Kong companies uh, 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 do something to uh, 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 um, constrain their, their activities, for example, in, in the United States or in the other places. And also question the legitimacy of Hong Kong representatives in international organizations. And also uh, uh, there are still a lot of uh, possible ways uh, to show the concern uh, of the West or the, the other from the other democracy countries, and um, uh, but is where well, this save the people being put into jail? I don't think so. Uh, so we need some rescue uh, plans for the Hong Kong protesters, and uh, maybe we can prepare some awards for some famous political prisoners and their families, try to take care of them, and also some fellowship or studentships for some young protests uh, to uh, give them some chances to leave Hong Kong and, uh, and uh, do something outside. So um, there are the other alternatives, I think that may be considered, but it's still, it may make things more complicated. That is so-called uh, clamor in the East and attack in the West. This come from the, the art of war. So, uh, 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 using the other issues to resist Beijing, but link it to Hong Kong issue. But this is, uh, I don't think, I think that you people should consider that, but yeah. it's still, it could be the, um, you know, not the first, uh, not a priority of the, the strategies to deal with the Hong Kong issue. Uh, I think that what we should prepare and uh, we can really, make this, uh, things better is to do something, the uh, rescue plans for the uh, political prisoners yeah. and also for the uh, young, young activists. So uh, this is some uh, um, thoughts that uh, I want to share with you about Hong Kong. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tong Hong, for your um, in-depth analysis. I'm now going to turn to um, Koji Kabotani. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I'm Koji Kagotani, an associate professor of economics, uh, Osaka University of Economics. So today, I would like to talk about whether American allies in North Northeast Asia can take a hard line toward China. So. Um, the U.S. formed a hub and spoke alliance network in East Asia in the post-war period. So three American allies are facing China's, um, China's ambitions. So three American allies have no official alliance relationships with each other. So these American allies are not formally allied with each other. Um, so we know uh, North Korea's nuclear development issue disturbs the pace of the US, Japan and South Korea, but I will not discuss it this time. 
Rather, I would like to focus on possible disagreements among three American allies. So Japan and South Korea have been involved in a series of political disputes. The most famous problem is the mutual disagreement over the solution of the comfort women issue. In addition, after the North Korean Navy locked in the P-1 surveillance aircraft of the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force, Japan excluded Korea from the export trade control white country and imposed a de facto embargo on the export of hydrogen fluoride, an essential product of semiconductor production, damaging the Korean economy. And South Korea then threatened to suspend the renewal of the general security of military information agreements forcing Japan and the United States to respond. On the other hand, uh, South Korea diplomatic relations with uh, Taiwan were unilaterally suspended um, in 1992. So relations with Taiwan are not necessarily strong. So um, diplomatic protest is, um, I wanna talk about some issues um, among three different allies. So each country pursues their national security policy in, the past, in their perspectives, right? For example, um, Japan passed the security related roles and then they started national military expansion and uh, South Korea um, offers appeasement policy, appeasement policy toward North Korea that disturbs you know, um, alliance politics among Japan and the United States, right? And then um, Taiwan also um, purchases uh, like uh, US made um, fighter jets, right? And so now, if you know, like each country pursues national security policies, always, you know, on China uh, lodge diplomatic protest. And you know, sometimes, you know, uh, like American allies also uh, lodge diplomatic protest. And then I really wanna analyze uh, what's the political consequences of a diplomatic protest? And so diplomatic protest is an attempt to express this dissatisfaction with behavior of the target country in words, just words, and peacefully resolve the situation, right? And the neighboring countries usually lodge a diplomatic protest against country's security policy when the country's security policy perceived as a challenge to the status quo. Okay. And so then in the target country, we expect the public shows rally phenomenon. And so, for example, public is more likely to support national leaders and they, they are more likely to support um, like defense policies and they are more likely to prefer to enhance um, hardline policy against um, protesting countries, right? And so even though diplomatic protest is worse. It backfire in the target country. That's a message from my research. And so uh, I learned uh, three different experiments in three countries. So I run endorsement experiments in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, and then uh, I find interesting uh, results. So I wanna briefly uh, explain it and I wanna share some parts, parts of the findings, okay? And so in 
our experiments. Now, first, um, we um, we separate the effect of diplomatic protest in two parts. And so a diplomatic protest consists of two elements. And first, you know, what kind of language the protest is and who is launching the protest. And so we separate the effect of a message and uh, the effect of a speaker or state, right? And then we find you know, the latter matters. Why? Because um, national security policy is controversial. And so the public often listen to the word from domestic politicians. And so not only foreign countries, domestic politicians also criticize incumbent, right? And so uh, usually um, people know the reason why domestic politicians or foreign countries lodge protest, okay? And then um, we expect rival country, even uh, arise, you know, we expect, you know, like a protest from rival country and arise, you know, uh, that's caused a phenomenon, but you know, we find only a rival country, you know, uh, cause rally phenomenon. And so, so that's, you know, our first finding. And then uh, in the target country, uh, diplomatic protest from rival country will increase support for national leaders and the national security policies and the term public preference into hawkish ones. And so I found these results in three different arrays. So Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. And so this is a very strong result. And so, uh, so I wanna conclude, uh, my findings. So Japan's military expansion, South Korea appeasement and the po policy toward North Korea and uh, uh, Taiwan's purchase of US fighter jets are controversial at home and abroad. So the message of a diplomatic protest doesn't matter. But if a quasi allies are involved in a series of political dispute, and then such a rival relationship allows diplomatic protests to can easily destroy trust among themselves. And so we need, we need a kind of a solution because you know, if we cannot uh, achieve a policy coordination among these three, con three countries, three allies, uh, it's very difficult to take a hard line toward China. And so, um, so I believe that you know, we really need um, US leadership to coordinate uh, national security policy among these uh, Northeast Asian allies. Okay, so that's a message from my research. And so that's all, thank you Great. so much. Great, thank you so much, um, Kagotone-san. We've already received a couple of questions about the challenges of policy coordination on the security front, but um, before we go to that, I hope I can now turn to Ian Chong. Thank you, Shoko. Um... And thank you to the Wilson Center for having me. Um, so what I'm going to be presenting today um, without slides is uh, Southeast Asia, which um, I don't know, I, I find it to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, Koji's looked at um, uh, three countries and I have to look at 11. That's the ASEAN 10 plus East Timor. So um, let's try to do this in 10 minutes. Um, okay, so I think uh, the first thing that um, many, uh, but notice about ASEAN is, um, and Southeast Asia is this claim about um, not choosing sides uh, between the US and China. Um, and there's this uh, apparently consistent message that's coming out from Southeast Asian capitals. Uh, but uh, what I would invite 
uh, people uh, to do is to try to peel that back a little bit because behind the very similar language is actually very different positions that come out from very different interests. So um, if you look at um, Southeast Asia, um, one very crude way of uh, cutting it is through is by looking at mainland Southeast Asia. So uh, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, Laos, Thailand, Myanmar, um, and uh, insular maritime Southeast Asia. So that would be um, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Brunei, uh, the Philippines, um, and also East Timor. So uh, the difference being that for maritime states, uh, and I guess you could put um, Vietnam in, in, uh, in this category a little bit is they're far more interested in maritime issues. So the South China Sea disputes, so whether they are a party to that dispute or not, um, their economies are far more tied uh, to the maritime domain. So even with Indonesia, who is not a disputant, or Singapore, who is not a uh, disputant, uh, they do uh, care a lot about uh, those sorts of issues. Now, um, for the mainland states, uh, they tend to be uh, more focused on so land-based kinds of development, um, what happens along rivers, um, uh, and the, the sort of connectivity on land. So the sorts, uh, and that will cut down uh, get you to different sorts of economic interests as well. So the mainland states tend to be more interested in the sort of connectivity, uh, belt and road kinds of projects, and the um, maritime states a little bit less. Um, and in, in addition to that, I think we can also cut um, cut up Southeast Asia in terms of looking at levels of economic development that have different kinds of needs. So you have the uh, lower income states like the Cambodias and the, and the Laos, uh, and they are really looking for a lot more investment uh, in those sort of basic infrastructure kinds of things. So then um, they're the middle income countries, um, uh, sort of like uh, uh, Indonesia, Thailand, they, what they want to do is to sort of move ahead uh, and sort of not just do the sort of basic stuff to move ahead. Of course, there's Singapore, which is the real outlier, uh, you know, being the only uh, really developed uh, country to, together with Brunei, but their economies are very different. One is based on energy, the other is not. Um, you know, they're really looking at very high end, end kinds of things. So uh, what you have then are countries that are actually pulling in very different directions, even if they're saying the same thing. Uh, for countries that um, are uh, interested in sort of basic commodity kind of trade uh, kinds of trade, uh, they are far more interested in sort of tying uh, into the China market um, and uh, getting uh, the basic infrastructure um, investment. For the for others, you know, they're looking at higher end uh, investment and higher and uh, more sort of uh, higher end kinds of trade um, that will tie them more to not just China. China is clearly the most important uh, bilateral trading partner, but to each other and also to Europe uh, and North America. Um, and uh, if you sort of look some more, what you find is that while the trading relationship with China is very strong, the investment relationship from uh, the US, from Europe, uh, from Japan actually outstrips uh, the the uh, investment relationship uh, from China. So this is realized investment, not so much um, the, the promised stuff. So what this means is that uh, while everybody's talking about not choosing sides, um, all the different uh, South Asian countries are actually pulling in very different directions. So what uh, the implication that follows from here is for any, uh, for any state that tries to develop a Southeast Asia policy, and uh, whether this is China or the United States, um, it has to be cognizant um, of uh, this large diversity. Um, and there's no cookie cutter solution. But the tricky thing, of course, is that Southeast Asian um, states, especially the ASEAN members, are very much into uh, talking about um, ASEAN. Some of it is legacy based. Uh, some of it um, is uh, comes from the fact that um, you know, uh, ASEAN provides a platform that boosts their uh, individual voices. So they're not willing to let that go at, at this point in time. Neither are they willing to reform, but that's a slightly different issue. Um, so they, so um, ASEAN members, at least, are keeping out Timor right now, are into sort of talking up ASEAN. So engagement with Southeast Asia, it's probably useful to talk up ASEAN and, and talk up ASEAN centrality, but also to look uh, separately at uh, bilateral relations or, or separate kinds of groupings of states where uh, cooperative mechanisms can come about. I think 
uh, we can make an argument that this is what uh, Washington is doing somewhat or has been trying to do uh, really since the uh, uh, second Bush administration uh, with fits and starts to be sure. But uh, the fact that they're looking at uh, Mekong Group, uh, the fact that uh, you, you see uh, the, with the recent uh, vice president presidential visit by uh, Vice President Harris, uh, the, the focus is on Singapore and Vietnam, right? countries that seem to provide um, a more stable basis for cooperation and sort of more space for growth in terms of the relationship with the US. Um, there are efforts to sort of um, uh, to bolster our sort of fraying relations um, with, um, with the Philippines uh, and, and Thailand, um, but uh, the rest of Southeast, and, and also with, with Indonesia, the rest of Southeast Asia a little bit less so, uh, in part because the, um, in part because the so domestic situations don't lend themselves very well to longer term sorts of projects. Malaysia right now is undergoing um, a protracted uh, political transition. Uh, you can make the same uh, argument about Thailand. Uh, Myanmar, of course, is struggling from the uh, aftermath of the coup. Um, and we don't have to go through all the Southeast Asian countries, but essentially, um, I think the smart thing to do uh, is to sort of focus on relationships where uh, there can be uh, positive uh, progress. Now, uh, what that also means um, is that while talking up ASEAN and talking about uh, ASEAN centrality, in effect, right, what we're going to see is more pressure pulling uh, ASEAN apart. And for, uh, I wish that were not the case. I wish ASEAN had reformed itself to better um, adjust to this sort of situation, but it has not. So a possible outcome would be ASEAN that is more um, pulled apart, perhaps becoming an empty shell, because certainly uh, Chinese efforts uh, to at outreach in Southeast Asia is doing very similar kinds of things. Um, they are focusing a bit more on um, Cambodia and Laos uh, uh, and Thailand. Uh, they don't know, quite know what to do with Malaysia, They're trying hard to, uh, uh, to win the Philippines and Indonesia over. Uh, and also, in China to who is talking up ASEAN, but uh, looking at you know key relationships which they want to build on. So I think the sort of broad outcome that uh, we are likely to expect um, is that there'll be very possibly a hollowing out of ASEAN. And what uh, is then important for major powers as they relate to, to the region is whether you can build stable blocks of relationships um, that can sort of uh, uh, help your position um, in, in the region. And so that would also entail having to look at um, what these various um, uh, countries are, uh, are, you know, are looking out to do, uh, what, you know, what sorts of cooperation they, they're looking out for. So um, for the uh, countries that are, are working with, uh, with both the US and, and China right now, I mean, the big thing is the economic plank, uh, which is a little bit missing on the US side. Uh, China's pushing hard on RCEP. Um, so I guess um, what remains to be seen is whether the Biden administration can offer anything in terms of trade. Uh, that's of course gonna be difficult given the domestic situation in the US at, at the present time. Um, uh, you know, with, with uh, questions about, you know, how much you want to open up, but, um, and also with the um, a partisan divide uh, that Shoko had talked about. But at any rate, I think this is the sort of broad contours um, of that, of the sort of very complex uh, network of uh, relations and uh, circumstances that we find in Southeast Asia. Um, so I guess that brings me up to time. I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you. Ian, for being mindful of the time and also providing us with so much food for thought. Um, let me turn to Andrew. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be part of this multinational panel and to offer a perspective from Washington, uh, where I've been uh, a fellow at the Wilson Center since last September um, and witnessing up close this transition from the Trump era to the Biden era. Um, I've been asked to offer some remarks that complement those, especially of Professor Kagwatani and Professor Chong at looking at US allies in East Asia, uh, but from a Washington perspective. Um, so as a, as a Wilson Center audience would know, um, there are uh, four so-called treaty allies in East Asia, Japan, um, South Korea, <clears throat> excuse me, the Philippines and Thailand, uh, plus our Australian and New Zealand treaty allies nearby. 
as well as numerous other security partners um, that function as allies in important ways, such as uh, Singapore and Taiwan uh, in particular, but also other security partners like in the Pacific Islands um, and states such as Vietnam and Indonesia. Um, so I'd like to offer some general thoughts about how there is some divergence of views in um, the US perception of threat from China among these eight or so countries and territories, but also um, overlap. And then um, I also wanna offer just a few reactions to some of what has been said by other panelists about specific countries. So first, um, the general thoughts. Um, as we've heard over this uh, past hour, um, each country or territory has its unique uh, set of concerns about China. Uh, which overlap with U.S. interests in many ways, but still are distinct. Um, different geography and different military capabilities among the U.S. allies and partners also play a major role in explaining different approaches to China. And this does pose um, real coordination challenges uh, for, for the U.S. with its allies and partners, um, as, as Professor Chung um, just really underscored in the case of ASEAN countries. Um, but I also think it offers many opportunities to build from. Um, as uh, U.S. Defense Secretary Austin said uh, in his July visit to Singapore, um, the U.S. seeks a, quote, constructive and stable relationship uh, with China. And it's not, not one of acrimony or forcing allies or partners to choose between the U.S. and China. Um, and I think that, that President uh, Biden's phone call to President Xi earlier this week also underscores the US desire for a constructive relationship with China, but also an honest one that addresses concerns of both the US and um, US allies and partners in the region. I'm personally rather optimistic about uh, the closer coordination of concerns about China uh, based on um, recent developments in the US and among allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific despite some of the concerns and differences we've heard uh, on the panel today. Um, the first in-person quad meeting uh, between uh, leaders of the US, Japan, India, and Australia has been scheduled uh, for next Friday here in Washington. And I think that's one cause of optimism that builds on, uh, I think, a successful uh, virtual summit uh, that happened near the start of the Biden administration back in March. And I think the recent productive visits of um, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and Vice President Kamala Harris uh, to Singapore and Vietnam recently, and also to the Philippines in the case of Secretary Austin, also underscores the seriousness uh, that the Biden administration places on coordination with regional allies and partners. Um, that these meetings uh, in, in Southeast Asia took place simultaneous to the US withdrawal from Afghanistan also, I think underscores the Biden administration's efforts to refocus attention on China and to US challenges and opportunities in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I, I'm sure many in this audience know that numerous regional leaders and commentators have vocally applauded in recent weeks uh, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan in order to focus on Indo-Pacific concerns, even, even despite the obvious difficulties there were in the US withdrawal. So I'll also note that Vice President Harris uh, shares my optimism to some degree uh, when uh, she noted in Singapore that in a speech, quote, U.S. engagement is about advancing an optimistic vision that we have for our participation and partnership in this region. And um, I think that this, this sort of optimism about opportunities was reflected in the wide range of agreements that Harris signed in Singapore, um, covering cybersecurity, uh, climate, um, epidemic, intelligence sharing, uh, economic cooperation, as well as uh, support she announced in Vietnam for uh, Vietnam's um, efforts to combat COVID. So I believe that we can expect um, looking forward that forthcoming US strategy documents that will come from the Biden administration soon will spell out in greater depth, uh, more of a strategy uh, for uh, greater use of US allies and partners in addressing the China challenge, um, both with Indo-Pacific partners and also with uh, European partners, which I know we'll hear about in just a moment. But I wanna offer just two quick examples in closing 
Um, one is giving a shout out to another uh, Wilson Center event that happened uh, this week uh, that relates to the US National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence a report that was released uh, back in March and that the Wilson Center did an event on earlier this week with Asia Program Director Aid Denmark. Uh, but it shows, you know, it, at a more concrete level, the opportunities for cooperation between the U.S. and its partners uh, in the area of managing artificial intelligence and cyber threats. And another example that um, that perhaps uh, we'll hear a bit more about uh, when we switch uh, to discussion of Europe is the just announced um, new agreement, um, the so-called AUKUS uh, agreement between the U.S., Australia, and um, Britain on uh, nuclear submarine development. Um, so um, in conclusion, uh, let me just say in, in response to a few things that, that I've heard on this panel already, um, I'm encouraged, you know, related to U.S.-Taiwan relations that um, the ranking uh, member and chair also of the House subcommittee on Asia, the Pacific, Central Asia, and nonproliferation has introduced the Taiwan Peace and Security Act uh, in June to underscore the importance of um, security and international space for Taiwan in the context of China's growing challenges. And I think this is particularly important given Professor Pond's research showing that um, there is just not much support in Taiwan for negotiation at this point uh, with, with China in, in, in the face of its belligerence. And I also think in relation to what uh, Professor Kagotani uh, noted um, that, that in his research, that we need US leadership uh, to have better coordination among allies. And I think that we've seen, again, really positive trends in, in that direction in, in the last six months. And um, I'm guessing uh, that uh, my co-panelist, uh, Brian, will um, give some examples of that in the case of Europe. So I look forward to hearing that and um, to hearing questions that may come. Thank you. Great, Andrew, thank you. And with that, Brian, thank you for being patient, so patient. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have been asked to talk about European perspectives on the US-China strategic competition. And uh, European views of China have undergone change in the past few years. Uh, there's been a, uh, an increasing recognition that China poses a number of challenges that have to be addressed. Uh, but at the same time, there are diverging opinions within Europe and differences of opinion between Europe and the United States that will complicate efforts to forge a, a united transatlantic approach toward China and the efforts by the Biden administration to bring Europe on board for strategic competition with China, which the administration considers to be an important component of its strategy. Uh, so in recent years, uh, there has been a change in Europe. Uh, for, for a long time, the view of China was largely benign. Uh, the view was that China was a trading partner and a source of economic growth. Uh, but in recent years, there's been a bit of a change. In 2019, the EU issued a report calling China a systemic rival. Uh, that same year, Germany's corporate lobby issued a report complaining about unfair business practices by China. The pandemic had a big effect on European attitudes toward China, uh, not just China's handling of the pandemic, but the wolf warrior diplomacy that followed it. And then in the summits that Biden attended in Europe in June, um, G7, US, EU, and NATO, all three of them issued declarations or communiques that criticized China in one way or another. And in the case of NATO, this was the first time that the communique had mentioned China. So uh, all of this, uh, underscores the fact that uh, although Europe recognizes that China isn't a direct military threat at present to the continent, nevertheless, it does pose a, a number of challenges, including in the realms of cyber, uh, disinformation, interference in domestic societies. And in general, uh, China's aim is to weaken Europe, divide it, and prevent it from aligning with the United States against China. There have been some uh, policy uh, initiatives and changes in recent years that reflect this, uh, largely at the urging of the United States. Several European countries have restricted Huawei's involvement in 5G networks. And also uh, Britain, France, and Germany have all turned their attention to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, they've all, all three of those countries, Germany most recently, have sent naval ships to the South China Sea 
as an expression of uh, support for the US position there in opposition to China's claims in the region. Uh, but at the same time, as I mentioned, there are different views in, in Europe. And um, so uh, I'll start by talking just a little bit about Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this has been a focus of China's efforts to make inroads and to some extent divide the EU and Europe as a whole. Uh, several members of uh, several countries in Central and Eastern Europe have participated in the, uh, the BRI, Italy also, uh, but Central and Eastern Europe is the focus of the 17 plus one initiative, although this uh, seems to have lost momentum recently with uh, both the Czechs and the Lithuanians in particular um, uh, standing up to China on a series of issues and Lithuania actually withdrawing from the forum. Uh, so, so there is that aspect, but if, if we look at the so-called E3, Britain, France, and Germany, there are also uh, differing perspectives there. Uh, Britain issued its integrated review of foreign and defense policy in March. It called China a systemic challenge and it criticized China for its abrogation of the Treaty on Hong Kong. Uh, as far as France is concerned, uh, President Macron's uh, statements have, have indicated that he views China as a multifaceted challenge in a number of areas, uh, but he uh, is, is opposed to efforts at decoupling from the Chinese economy. And when we come to Germany, I think here's the, the crux of the issue. Germany is the most powerful country in, in the European Union. It has the largest economy. Uh, it has a, an extensive trading relationship with China. And during the second half of 2020, when Germany was in the six month rotating presidency of the EU, it pushed through uh, the conclusion of negotiations with China on the comprehensive agreement on investment, uh, concluding those negotiations at the end of 2020, even as the incoming Biden administration said that it wanted to consult with Europe first. And so that's now been put on hold because uh, 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 Europe, as well as uh, Britain, the United States, and Canada imposed sanctions on China over uh, its policies in Xinjiang, and then China retaliated, and now the CAI is, is frozen for the moment. But Germany, by pushing that forward, uh, showed how badly it wants to maintain close economic ties with, with China. And essentially, under Merkel's leadership, China, uh, Germany has essentially tried to maintain equidistance between the United States and China in order to preserve those economic relationships. Uh, the German auto industry in particular is, is heavily dependent on the German, on the Chinese economy. Uh, Volkswagen uh, has a factory in Xinjiang, which has been a source of controversy, and 40% of its exports go to China. So this leaves both the company and Germany vulnerable to Chinese pressure. And so earlier this year, Merkel said that she was opposed to the formation of blocs. She said during the Munich, Munich Security Conference that uh, the interests of Germany and Europe will not always converge with those of the United States. And then during her recent visit to Washington, uh, essentially the message was that Germany doesn't want to be involved in a new Cold War with China, and it doesn't want economic decoupling. And the United States dropped its uh, opposition to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, but uh, there was some speculation that it might get something in return from Germany on support for policy toward China, but there was no public announcement of anything like that. So uh, the Biden administration views Europe as key to its strategy and Germany is the key to involving Europe in that strategy. But uh, for reasons I've discussed, this is very difficult um, it, it's very difficult for the United States to gain Germany's support for its policies toward China. And Merkel will leave office later this year, but, but the, the, camp, uh, the election coming up in a few days, the campaign leading up to it offers few reasons to believe that Germany's policies are likely to change fundamentally, no matter how the election turns out. So finally, in conclusion, I'll just say that Europe really has a couple of big challenges in dealing with China. Number one is to build resilience, of build, build, up, build up the resilience of its own society against the kinds of challenges that China poses and uh, that I already mentioned. And the second one is that Europe needs to address the reality that the United States is going to be more and more focused on China in the future, uh, including in its military and, and security policies. 
And the 2018 National Defense Strategy of the United States indicated that the United States would have, would try to maintain the ability to defeat one great power in one theater at a time while deterring another one, but not necessarily defeating another one at the same time. So this indicates that if a war were to break out on two fronts in Europe and, and in Asia, the United States would be very hard pressed to respond in that kind of a situation. And the United States will continue to be preoccupied with the, the Russian security threat to Europe, but increasingly that will be a secondary concern. And the primary concern will be the strategic challenge from China. And this means that there's likely to be uh, increased US focus on Asia, potentially a diversion of attention and resources from Europe to Asia. And so this will, will call upon Europe to respond. It's going to be necessary for Europe to increase defense spending to deal with this. And so we see initiatives from Macron in France calling for strategic autonomy for Europe. Uh, he hasn't gotten much traction with that yet, but he recognizes this issue that the United States will be increasingly focused on Asia. And for this reason, he's also called for outreach toward Russia to try to uh, pull Russia away from China. But I think that's a difficult task right now because of how close that relationship has become. So uh, all of these issues are going to be increasingly high on the agenda for Europe. And it's, it's going to be a challenge for US policymakers to bring Europe on board and, and especially on the second issue that I mentioned to get Europe to uh, spend more on defense to take uh, take more responsibility for its own security so that the United States can devote the necessary attention and resources to Asia. That will be a really key issue. Great. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, we have a lot of questions. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but um, I actually want to continue this um, discussion about um, military security. Um, and I want to turn to a question from Jesse Seto, uh, Seto um, of Georgetown University, who asks, is there any plausible scenario in which South Korea or Japan would be wooed away from the US security guarantee? I'd like to actually add Singapore to that list too, and also perhaps um, tack in a question um, from Ted Ling, um, who asks that um, Southeast Asia um, has diverse interests and a strong stake in good relations with both the United States and China, yet there is divergence um, between countries like Indonesia and in Indonesia and Malaysia on the one hand, um, and other countries on the other who do not want to confront or criticize China, China publicly. So I think these are questions that would be geared to uh, Koji, Ian, and Andrew in particular, if I, any of you would like to uh, chime in on that, it'd be great. Shigoku, if I could, if I could take a, a first stab at the, at, at the question, I think that the, the very first thing to point out is that, yes, the, the U.S. should never take any ally or partner for granted, so we shouldn't just assume that, that these partners will always band together with the US. But in the case of uh, both Singapore and South Korea, I think that what we see is a clear preference to have a deep US engagement in, in the region. And in the case of South Korea in particular, what we see is a surprising increase in defense spending and in, in military capability increases in South Korea in just the past few years. South Korea is now spending almost the same amount as Japan um, on, on defense. So I think, although there's a con there could be a concern, I think in reality, we're not, we're not seeing that happen. Um, let me add something on, on Singapore. Um, I think Singapore is pulling in a slightly different direction. Uh, and probably this is something that um, policymakers in, in the US might want to pay attention to. So uh, in the Pew poll that, um, that was uh, shown earlier, I mean, if you look at the Singapore one, it wasn't on, on the slides, but um, if you look at Singapore, the public, right, generally, uh, has a lot more trust in, in the PRC. Um, some of this has to do with uh, being co-ethnic. Some of this has to do with the fact that um, I think the the push towards uh, you know building up the sort of sense of uh, co-ethnicity uh, uh, from the PRC is quite strong. However, 
if you look at uh, the state of Southeast Asia survey done with elites uh, by the, Institute, uh, the Yusuf Ishak Institute of Southeast Asian Studies out from Singapore, what you find is that Singapore elites though, um, their views on China seem far more congruent, right? With where the rest of the region and the rest of the world are going, they're far more um, distrustful um, of, of the PRC. So uh, I guess uh, in Singapore's case, what would be interesting to note is that um, there are, tensions pulling in different directions, right? Which I suppose is emblematic of this not choosing sides business. Uh, you base the, uh, ideally you have a nice little, you know, space that you can live in, but uh, in a less ideal world where you have uh, tensions pulling in different directions, um, you know, there's this sort of shearing force that uh, may be quite difficult to contend with. So um, if we're looking from Washington, uh, one of the things about shoring up that Singapore relationship would be to consider um, how to reduce that shearing force uh, that seems to be developing within Singapore, um, and uh, such that the elites and the uh, public, you know, pull more in a similar direction. Uh, so, I mean, it's something. Thing that previously we, we saw in Taiwan as well. So I think it's possible to, to address, uh, but uh, it I certainly uh, would be good not to sort of take that Singapore relationship for granted because the elites, um, while very important in Singapore, um, you know, they are subject to public pressure. Kursi, I don't know if you, okay, good. Yeah, uh, I, I briefly want to talk about the Japan case. And so, um, like um, uh, uh, public, public and you know, politicians always, you know, rely on the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, and so like their debate and you know, always based on the existence on the of the um, U.S. U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, and so I think you know, um, um, like you know, stance, you know, like. A, Probably remains, but nowadays, you know, like uh, even uh, we have, you know, incoming uh, LDP presidential elections, and then uh, now, you know, candidates, you know, uh, show shows their preference for military expansions, and then uh, like a public also uh, don't worry about, you know, like uh, such a stance. And so like, uh, for, for example, you know, like 20 years ago, probably uh, some portion of people uh, worry about uh, those stance because, you know, like older people um, worry about uh, like uh, uh, past action of Japan. So like they, they have a kind of experience uh, from the World War II. And so like they, their preference are just a pacifist. Uh, so, um, but now, now, you know, public also changing. And then uh, like uh, I saw uh, some, some news uh, about uh, South Korea and, you know, South Korea's military spending uh, is now more than Japan this year, uh, Japan's spending this year. And so now, you know, like um, uh, Northeastern allies uh, start, you know, military expansion and so, it might cause you know, arms race you know, between you know, not on, not only between U.S. and China, uh, China and you know like American allies also, and so politics you know like uh, uh, changing and uh, probably you know like uh, this process uh, makes you know like alliance politics more complicated, and then you know as I told you. Um, like um, given the arms race, you know, uh, diplomatic protest also happens. And then uh, the, the relationship between allies also uh, getting worse. And so like we, we really have to you know, think about at this point. And so now, you know, public really uh, watching politics, real politics. And so that's the important part. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much for those silvering words. Um, with that, I am afraid we've actually exceeded our, our time. And I know that there have been a great deal of um, questions from the audience. And I really want to thank you for um, sending them in. And I do apologize for not being able to get to them. Um, I hope um, you will all join me in, in thanking 
our speakers today um, from all across um, the world, uh, spanning three continents. It's been great, um, thanks to Zoom. Um, there will be other opportunities to continue this conversation, but until then, uh, thank you, um, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.